as we gather as a family, let's enter this time of worship. Let us spend this presence with the Lord. Let us come into the Holy of Holies. So the Lord is here among us. My dear brothers and sisters in the Lord Jesus Christ, welcome to this session on family. As we look at the scriptures, we recognize that the family plays a central role in God's plan. And this is what I want to briefly speak about with a focus on uh, the sacrament of matrimony. And so when we look at the scriptures, what do we find? Beginning with the book of Genesis, we clearly are shown that God himself is a family. God is a trinity of persons. And therefore the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit can be quite certainly ascertained already at the beginning of the book of Genesis, where God speaks, the word is the word of God, the second person in the Trinity, and God's spirit hovers over the water. Again, when God wants to create humankind, uh, he says, let us, create humankind in our own image and likeness. And so we can see already with uh, looking at it from the perspective that Jesus gives us that the Father and I are one and I will send the Spirit. Everything that he has is mine. When we combine these two elements of Genesis and what we read in the Gospels, we can be certain that God is a trinity. 
And therefore, when God is a trinity, obviously, if he wants to create us in his own image and likeness, then he would want us to really be in the concept of a family, in the concept of a group. And so family is something that we see right at the beginning of the scriptures and right at the end of the scriptures as well. And therefore, right in between from beginning to end, time and again, different aspects of family are given to us. And I'd like to kind of, in a way, just introduce these to you throughout the remaining days of this program. You will have different aspects of it being highlighted, but I'd like to just kind of introduce these to you so that you are able to really participate more fully in what is to come. And so when God makes humankind, what do we notice? We notice that God creates them male and female. Male and female together are the image and likeness of God. And then God gives them this command, the command to be fruitful and to multiply and to fill the earth. The second is what we see in the promise that God makes and when he says, therefore, a man will leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife and the two will become one flesh. Now, looking at these two uh, verses in scripture, what do we recognize in terms of God's mind? What can we second guess in a way? Very clearly that God wants humankind as male and female because that's how he created them in his image and likeness. When you combine this with the second verse of being fruitful and multiply, obviously he wants a family. And the third aspect is therefore a man should leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. This family is seen in the context of sacred or holy matrimony. And so we look at these two aspects throughout the scriptures. Throughout the Old Testament, God uses very familial terms. He uses words that are to do with family. He uses concepts that deal with family. And in a specific way, he uses things that refer to marriage as such. And therefore, for example, Israel is referred to as the firstborn of Yahweh. When uh, God tells Moses to go to Pharaoh, uh, Moses speaks of Israel as God's firstborn. And therefore, these are very, very important kind of words that we find in terms that we find in the scriptures, which lead us to deeper introspection on the role of what God is doing in scripture. And therefore, when we look at the remaining of the Old Testament, what do we find? When we look at the entire chunk of writings that we have, we find all the great promises that God makes in the book of Genesis. So God promises Adam and Eve that he will find a solution to the problem of sin. God promises Noah that uh, in and through Noah, he uses Noah to really bring about a second creation. He uses Abraham, etc. and makes promises to him that by his descendants, the world will be blessed, the nations of the earth will be blessed. In and through Moses, he brings about the freedom of a people. In and through the monarchy, especially through David and Solomon, there is the concept of the temple, of the chosen people, of all the people really going up to Jerusalem and praising God. And all this paints a beautiful tapestry for us, a beautiful picture. And we have a beautiful tapestry laid out before us. And therefore, we have, for example, at the beginning, the promises that God makes in the book of Genesis, the promises and the blessings, be fruitful and multiply, subdue the earth and fill it. The same thing is given also to Noah and the same, very same promise is given to Abraham, but in slightly different words. What does he tell Abraham? He says, your descendants will be as many as the stars of heaven and as many as the grains of sand on the seashore. So what God is really kind of conveying to Abraham is that he's going to be using Abraham and really bring about an entire family and through him, all the nations of the earth will receive their blessing. So Abraham is going to be that figure that really unites in a way everything through to God. But it's not only through Abraham, it's through his descendant. And this descendant, as we'll see later, is Jesus Christ. But let's fast forward a bit 
after the promises god like you and i would teach our children uh, he gives them certain laws these are good these are bad these are the things you do these are the things that you avoid because they are dangerous and so we have the books of the laws we have uh, the pentateuch as a whole but more specifically leviticus and deuteronomy which deals specifically with the law we have the teaching of how to pray just as you teach your children to pray so to god wants his children to know how to pray he wants his children to know how to call on him he wants his children to know how to relate to different situations in the world and so we have for example the book of psalms that is really the prayer book of the church but really when you look at the psalms what do they deal with they deal with different emotions and different situations and in each of these situations the end of it is always giving thanks to god and so this is primarily very very important to notice that at the end of it the focus is always on giving praise and thanksgiving to god so no matter if the situation is happy if the situation is sad if the situation is confrontative if the situation is challenging if the situation is hopeless the end is always giving thanks to god and so this is something that we learn very clearly we also have god teaching his children right from wrong just as you would teach your children do this and avoid that and so we have the book of judges which give us 12 cycles of movement of people of the israelites the children of god the first born of yahweh who go through sin who fall back on god who get healed and who again fall into sin so 12 cycles of these are given to us in the book of uh, the judges but we also see this specifically in the prophets who time and again speak out against the injustice and against uh, the social inequalities in Israel how they are not keeping the law in its true context we also have the aspect of comfort comfort of hope and of correction that we find in the prophets so very beautifully which we will just be uh, listening to now as we begin advent very soon comfort or comfort my people says the lord your god cry out loud to jerusalem god has pardoned you uh, from the prophet isaiah and what beautiful words where god himself reaches out to his people they have gone through a lot of pain a lot of struggle and god is that comforting god just as you parents when your child suffers a lot even though your child may be at times wrong the first thing that comes out of you is comfort is a warm embrace is a thing to tell your child everything is going to be fine and so we can see very clearly that god is using all these kind of different things that you and i use in the family that you and i use in addressing our children and in teaching our children god is using something very very similar And finally we come to experience God's love in the gospels where Jesus Christ comes on the scene says greater love has no man than to lay down his life for his friends and so as we look at what is happening in the old testament the entire old testament in a way prepares us for what the new testament in the gospels is going to give us and what does Jesus give us in the gospel he speaks of his father he speaks of god's love for us he speaks of god embracing the whole of humanity as his children and how do we know this because there's just one prayer that jesus taught us in the entire gospels and that prayer is the our father exactly our father not god my father not o oh father but our father our together and father which is a relational term when you speak of father you obviously speak of children no man becomes a father unless he has a child and therefore the whole concept of god being not just jesus as father but our father means that he is the father of the whole of humanity and in and through jesus god completes the promise that was made to abraham through your descendants all the nations of the world will receive their blessing and so it is important for us to understand where does all this fit in or rather where does 
matrimony and family life fit into this whole concept. The first thing, my dear brothers and sisters, is that all that the Old Testament is doing is leading us to the person of Jesus. And Jesus is the love of the Father. And what does Jesus teach us? He teaches us to call God our Father. But look at the words of the Our Father. How do the words pan out for us? Our Father, who art in heaven, may your name be held holy. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so the entire focus of the prayer of Jesus is that God's will be done on earth as it is being done in heaven. That God's kingdom and God's reign may come on earth as it is in heaven. And that <coughs> is something we need to focus on. So how does God exactly work these things out? How does God want his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven? <coughs> the first thing that we recognize very clearly in the scripture is that God envisages this in and through the family bond or in and through the sacrament of matrimony. I'm going to use just two examples from the New Testament that really kind of paint this picture beautifully. The first is from Ephesians chapter 5 verses 21 to 33. And this is a reading that many couples take on their choose on their marriage day. It's one of the readings for marriage. But what is important is that this reading, while it explains to us what marriage is all about, it in a way summarizes all that God is doing in the scriptures and in and through Jesus. It invites us to recognize how God is really bringing about his will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so what do we find? We find Paul here using the example of Christ as the head and the church as his body. And therefore, in its true context, what Christ is really talking about is not so much of husband and wife, but he's referring to the mystery of Christ and his church. How is Christ and his church united? Are they the same or what is the dynamic that goes on between them? And the answer that Paul gives us is using the example of marriage. And he says there are many things that we can infer from marriage, but I'm looking at this from the perspective of Christ and his church. And so what did Christ do for his church? He founded the church. He gave himself up for her. He surrendered his life to for her and made her holy and clean and washed her and prepared her as his bride. And then what does the church do? The church does the same. The church in a way empties herself, surrendering herself to Christ. The church gives herself up totally and allows herself to be washed in and through the waters flowing from the side of Christ. And the church listens to Christ and is obedient to Christ. Now, this Paul sees using the concept of marriage. When we look at a husband and a wife, Paul uses this example and he says the husband is the head of his wife. And therefore, every husband like Jesus Christ is called to give himself up for his wife to really create the bond of marriage and to really make sure that his wife is always kept clean. Now, there are many things that we might wake up and suddenly start saying, oh, wait a minute, this sounds a little outlandish. No, the background of this is found in the Old Testament, in the Garden of Eden. What Adam could not do, Adam could not protect his wife. Christ protects his wife by giving himself up for her. Adam held back. Adam wasn't willing to let go of his life in order to protect Eve, his wife. Christ does precisely that. He gives himself up in love, in complete surrender, so that he can save his wife. But more than that, he can wash her and keep her without stain or blemish. Now, this is the background to what Paul is speaking of in the letter to the Ephesians. But then he goes on to speak also of the wife 
says wives must be subject to your husband as the church is subject to Christ. Why? Well, think of it this way. If if the wife wasn't subject to a husband, if, if the wife doesn't cooperate in a marriage, then there is no real marriage. So while the husband takes the role of the head as Christ, obviously the wife as the body would follow. Imagine your head and body that are not in synchronous mode. Uh, what would happen to them when they are not in sync? Your head will move in one way, your body will move in another, your head wants one your body wants another and we call these things sickness. When your mind and your body do not coordinate, we are sick. But this is precisely what Paul uses when he speaks of marriage. He speaks of marriage as the mystery between Christ and his church. He does two things there. The first is he equates all that Christ has done with within the concept of marriage. He uses marriage as an example to show us that we can understand in a way what Christ has done exactly. The second aspect that he does is he introduces the whole concept of family life, which is given to us in the passages that follow this particular passage. And so very clearly, we are able to see these uh, two aspects of the husband and the wife. Let's move to the sacrament of matrimony before we come to the second passage of scripture. What happens in the sacrament of matrimony? If you've paid attention to any of the nuptials, what are the words that the couple exchanges? I take you to be my husband or wife. I promise to be true to you in good times and in bad, to love you and to honor you all the days of my life. Now let's go back to Ephesians. What is it that Christ did? Christ chose the church, he honored her, he loved her, irrespective of the good and bad. Christ gives himself up completely. That's the promise that not just the husband, but the couple take. I promise to be true to you in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health. I will love you and honor you all the days of my life. So the first aspect is that of total self-giving, a total surrender, that I do not belong to myself anymore, but I surrender myself completely and totally to the other. I am willing to give my life in your hands and I am willing to accept your life in mine. That's the first aspect. The second is that this exchange is devoid of any conditions. It is not that I take you to be my husband or my wife as long as you provide for the family or as long as you cook and clean the house, etc. There are no conditions. The conditions are I choose, I choose to be true to you. That's the only condition. The condition is I make that choice. And if I make that choice, I am not basing it on you. I am basing it on my self emptying. And so this really is the basis of what we are looking at when we speak of marriage, but in a special way when we speak of our relationship to God. The third aspect is that this is founded on love. This whole self-giving is founded on love. To trust, to honor and to love are founded on this aspect of love. When I love you, I choose to love you irrespective of whatever you are and whatever you do. That is true love. Any love that has conditions attached to it is not really true love in that sense. It is a fair weather love. If things go well, I'll be in love with you. If things don't go well, then sorry. No, that is not love. That can never be a covenant. That is a contractual relationship. But that is a relationship that you can have with anyone else. So what's the difference between any other relationship and the exclusivity of a marriage relationship? The fact that they give each themselves to each other is a sign of the promise that they have taken that I belong to you and you belong to me. Why is this based on love? 
because this is based on God. The Bible tells us that God is love. And therefore, if you want to base anything, if you want to see success in anything, you've got to always base it on someone who is eternally successful, who is eternally unchanging and who is by definition eternal, God. If you want to understand love, you have to understand what God is doing. And so when we look at the entire Old Testament, what we find is God showing us his love in signs and symbols and finally showing us his love in the passion, the death and resurrection of Jesus. And if you want to know this love, what it is all about, Paul comes to our rescue again in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. He tells us of love in general, not just about human love, but what is love. In other words, he is defining who God is. God is love, but then what is love? Well, love is seen in God's patience, in kindness, in understanding, in not being arrogant, in not being boastful, etc. Now you begin to understand why Jesus had to die for us. Because God could prove his power by just flexing his muscles. But that's not what love is. Love is never arrogant. Love is not boastful. And so many brothers and sisters, when you look at your life, irrespective of whether you're married or not, it tells you of the greater relationship that you are called to have with God. And one of the most beautiful relationships that we could ever look forward to is that of a family, is that of matrimony. Each one of us, whether we are single like me as a priest or you perhaps as a married person, each one of us is born in a family and each one of us experiences God's love in that family. We experience one aspect or the other, sometimes more, sometimes less. But the point here is that each one of us understands what it means to call God our Father. It means to walk in His ways as children. It means to bring that love that He has for us, that love which is in heaven, on earth, in our lives, in our relationships. And this is what we see in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, which speaks of a new heaven and a new earth and a new Jerusalem coming down from heaven as a bride adorned for a husband. So what begins in Genesis in marriage? We see the concept of marriage right through the scriptures. And now at the end, what is God doing? He's uniting the world to himself, the church, in and through a marital bond. Why a marital bond? Remember the vows. I promise to be true to you in good times and in bad. God has been faithful. God has been true. And now it is our turn to be faithful and to be true, to keep up our part of the vows. This can be seen in our marital life, in our relationships, in the way we deal with others, in our spiritual life, in our prayer, in our relationships within the family, with our in-laws, with our brothers and sisters, with everyone around us, but especially with those who hate us, with those whom we don't get along well with. This is the challenge, to be true to God in good times and in bad, in sickness and in health, to love Him and honor Him all the days of our life. Incidentally, this is the most important command that God gave the Jews. They call it the Shema. Thou shalt love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And Jesus enlarges this command by saying, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Loving God, loving neighbor can be understood in the context of marriage. And this is not a marriage just between me and my spouse. It is between us and our Father in heaven who gives us everything. You and I are called to bring his kingdom here on earth. And this kingdom will happen, will take place when we learn to love as God loves us. God bless you all. Enjoy the remainder of the talks. 
and may we truly be renewed as a family, a family of God. God bless you.